hello and welcome to the broadcast. So good to be with you again today. And once again, I'm joined by a very dear friend, Bill Federer. Bill, thank you for being with us again on the broadcast today. Mark, great to be with you. It's always so good. And I do want to encourage all of you, stay with us till the very end of the broadcast. We want to pray over you and share some important things there with you. What we have been doing, and, and I want to point out once again your book, Bill, um, Backfired, and the subtitle here is A Nation Founded on Religious Tolerance No Longer Tolerates Its Founder's Religion. And I remember one day I actually called you and before I started into this and asked you, and I was, I was flabbergasted by some of the things that you told me that are in this book. And uh, the essence of it was that you talked about that there were all these Christians in the original 13 colonies, but they were not acting very Christian toward each other. And, and you actually told of a priest that was tarred and feathered and paraded through town, and we were talking. And I had to stop and go, Bill, was that a figure of speech or was that literal? Tell, tell us that story. Yeah, so Maine used to be part of Massachusetts, and Canada was Catholic, founded by the French, and so you had border situations on some of the towns, and a French uh, priest went to this one town in Maine, and the people uh, tarred and feathered him and ran him out of town on a rail. Now, are these Christians doing the tarring and the feathering? Yeah, yeah. So, so nothing's changed much today. <laughs> and so, so not only would you dip them in hot tar and then throw feathers on them, you would stick a big, uh, like a two by four, or a, you know, un between the guy's legs, and then you would lift him up on the shoulders of two people, and then they would hold the legs down. So this guy's it's a rail. And, 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 and they'd be like parading him through town and then they would dump him outside of town and he'd have to figure out what to do after that. Is, is that possibly where the saying come from about running them out on a rail? Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. And, uh, wow. and then at the same time, you had Massachusetts and uh, they not only burnt witches in the 1600s, about 19 of them, which is a small number compared to what was going on in medieval Europe at that time. Um, and it was the Christians that, that eventually stopped that. Um, but you had, in Massachusetts, Quakers. And Quakers um, were a different form of church government where they didn't believe in having pastors. It's just the congregation. They called it a society of friends. And everybody's equal, and so the Quakers sort of pioneered the anti-slavery movement, and so there were good things that came out of that. Um, and they did believe in the light of conscience and stuff, but the Puritans didn't like that. And so they told this one uh, group of Quakers, um, get out, and they chased them out. And they said, if you come back, we'll, we'll whip you. And they came back and they whipped them. And then they chased them out and they said, if you come back again, we'll kill them. Well, they came back and they killed them. So four Quakers were killed in Massachusetts. And so, um, and so they, the colonies didn't get along. It was only when they had the war with England and the first Continental Congress and a motion was made to open with prayer. And John Adams wrote a record to his wife. He says that the Anglicans didn't want to hear a prayer from the Presbyterians, that didn't want to hear a prayer from the Quakers, or didn't want to hear a prayer from the Baptists. And the whole thing was about to fall apart before it got started. And Sam Adams stands up, he says, I'm no bigot. I can hear a prayer of any man of piety who at the same time is a patriot of our nation. So they imposed upon Reverend Jacob Duche, an Anglican, to come in, and he was sort of risking it to give uh, the blessing to these group of people. And he um, opened with prayer, and John Adams said that uh, he broke out and he read from the, the Book of Common Prayer for that day. They like had a daily prayer for each day. And um, which happened to be Psalms 35 that sort of talked about God saving us from being attacked. And then he broke out in, into an extemporary prayer that stirred the bosom of every man present. And he said it brought tears to the eyes of the old Pacific Quakers. And, and Washington was on his knees praying and so was, was on his knees praying. And, and um, 
and he says, I beg you, he's writing to Abigail, I beg you, read that Psalm, Psalm 35. And, uh, and then uh, Reverend Jacob Duche went across the street to his church, opened the Book of Common Prayer, and every place where it said, pray for the king, he scratched it out and he said, pray for the Congress. And um, anyway, uh, so you had them working together and you had most of them were Anglican or they later called it Episcopal. And then the next group would, of size were the Presbyterians. And then the next were the Lutherans and then Baptists and then uh, plain Christian and then one Catholic. And, but they were all Christian. And Bill, if I can interject here, really, it was a little bit on the unusual that a prayer meeting would come together like this, would you say? Because they kind of kept to their own, but now they're coming together to pray. And I know that John Adams was so moved. He wrote that letter to his wife, Abigail. And then I went and read the 35th Psalm. And really, what they had was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in that prayer meeting because some of those people were kind of staunch. And I think uh, Reverend Duche kind of comes in with his entourage. His pontificals. And, yes. His robes. And, and, and so really you had a lot of people that normally didn't run together. And, and the way I see it now looking back is the hand of God brought them together, which is what I see going on right now in America exactly. today. There's a lot of pastors we've kept to ourselves. Uh, we've siloed, but now this persecution is kind of bringing us together and we're putting aside our differences, praying together, working together, laboring together. And to me, I see kind of a repeat of what you're talking about in your book here called Backfired. Yeah, it's God blessed the unity of the spirit. So mm. it's not the unity of the mind. We, we have trouble agreeing with everybody on everything. Most guys have trouble agreeing with their wives on everything. I don't, I don't even agree with myself on everything. Well, really, <laughs> and it's the unity of the faith, not the unity of doctrine. Yeah, it, it's the, the unity of the spirit. And so you agree on the, the essentials. In other words, um, Jesus died and rose again, and it's through him we get to heaven. And the, that's the ultimate common denominator. And the others, there's a, a bit of grace on church structure, how to set it up. Is it an apostolic succession through a, an anointed bishop uh, to a, or is it a congregational model? It's like they, they would have a little give and take on that. And, uh, but, uh, but they work together. And so that each one of them would have the freedom to do what they think is the best. And, and so it was a unique situation. I, you know, in reading the, the history of each colony, if the Anglicans thought they could have won all by themselves, you would have had Virginia and New York maybe basically teaming up and declaring independence. But they realized that they needed each other. Oh, my. There was an interesting story where uh, George Washington's army was at Harvard Yard outside of Boston. And the British, you know, the Battle of Bunker Hill and all that. So Boston was the original city being attacked. And the Connecticut soldiers we're gonna do their annual burning of the Pope in effigy, right? So they have a straw man that they would stop, but they would dress him up as the Pope and they would burn him uh, to sort of keep alive this Catholic Protestant controversy. And George Washington is like, guys, we have Catholics that are fighting with us against the King. So we're like, not gonna burn the Pope in effigy anymore. <laughs> and, um, and, and so there was this, if you're willing to be in the trenches and so, so before the revolution, the attitude was, if you don't like our denomination, fine, start your own colony. After the revolution, the attitude was, well, we may not agree on religion all the time, but you are willing to fight and die for my freedom. I need to let you practice your faith. And so this is this tolerance. And then they began to expand. So at the time of the revolution, 98% of the country was Protestant, 1% Catholic, 3 million people, 30,000 Catholics, and one tenth of a percent Jewish, 3,000 Jews in a country of 3 million people, only seven synagogues in the whole country. Right. And then after the Irish potato famine in the early 1800s, Catholic percentage went from 1% to 20%. Um, but even in 1965, a survey was done and 93% of Americans identified themselves as Christian in 1965. 
93%. That's around 69% Protestant and 24% Catholic. And then there was um, uh, 3% Jewish. And so, so the country was, in 1965, Judeo-Christian. And so you have a president. So, so they tried to say, well, uh, you know, this term Christian nationalism. And they say, this is, a, this is bad. And the first thing we have to realize is that nationalism is the opposite of globalism. There are globalists that want a one world government, that want to erase all individual countries' governments. They're like Klaus Schwab and George Soros, and they're wanting to do a great reset, which is an orchestrated crisis that'll get the entire world into fear and panic so they'll surrender their freedoms to this global government. And um, so uh, whether it's a financial crisis, whether it's a healthcare crisis, whether it's an Islamist crisis, whether it's a China, whatever it is, they want to have crises that get people into fear. Klaus Schwab said, if the last 500 years in Europe and America have taught us anything, is that it is in times of acute crises that boosts the power of the state. And so, so nationalism is the opposite of globalism. And I'd like to interject on that. I really want to hear what you've got to say about this bill because uh, there are certain individuals that are trying to uh, take this term Christian nationalist and, and create a stigma around that term. And I personally and our church have been tagged as Christian nationalist friends of mine and really is what we are is we love our country, we love the Lord, we love liberty and freedom. And and I'm I'm when I first heard it, I had to call our, our good friend Alex McFarland and I said, Alex, what's what's this Christian nationalist thing? Because I, I read an article about me <laughs> and I found out that's what somebody was tagging me with, and I had another friend that had that, and another friend and another pastor. And I had to find out what is it, and I found out it's this. It's this stigmatizing of that phrase. So I'm very interested in what you have to say and what it really is and kind of untangle that for us. Yeah, so they're picking out a word that has negative connotations and it's very similar to the pro-life movement. Everybody in the pro-life movement calls themselves pro-life, but the other people call you anti-abortion. Why? Because anti is negative. And they want to call themselves pro-choice, right? And so it's the battle over the words and the labels that are used. We like the label pro-life. They want to give us this negative label, anti-abortion. And so Christian nationalism used to be called Christian patriotism. And every president, Democrat and Republican encouraged it. And, you know, Lincoln's inaugural address. And so Lincoln was... Uh, the 16th president, and he um, uh, said intelligence, patriotism, Christianity, and a firm reliance on him who has never yet forsaken his favored land are still competent to adjust in the best way all our present difficulty. And so, um, uh, and then you have um, uh, George Washington, and, and I have these quotes here just to be able to, to read them. So George Washington uh, gives an order to his troops and he says, to the highest glory of patriot, it should be our higher glory to add the more distinguished character of Christian. So he's mentioning patriot and Christian in the first sentence. So he has no problem being a patriot and being a Christian. And then you have Teddy Roosevelt, and he's a Republican. He's the first president to have a black man in the White House for dinner, Booker T. Washington. Lincoln, Republican, freed the slaves. So the Republicans were anti-slavery and the Democrats were pro-slavery. And the Democrats had Jim Crow laws and black codes and started the KKK and did lynchings. And so Republican Ulysses S. Grant starts the Department of Justice, passes, passes the 1871 Ku Klux Klan Act. They have 13,000 pages of testimony of Democrats in the South persecuting and lynching blacks. And so... Uh, so Teddy Roosevelt said, as Bishop Galloway of Mississippi said, the mob lynches a Negro. Every Christian patriot in America needs to lift up his voice in loud and eternal protest against this mob spirit. So he says, OK, Christian patriots, we are against lyn lynchings. And then you have um, Franklin Roosevelt during World War II. 
He's passing out Gideon's New Testaments and Book of Psalms to all the soldiers. And he writes the foreword to it. As commander-in-chief, I take pleasure in commending the reading of the Bible. And so here he says, the whole world is divided between pagan brutality and the Christian ideal. We choose human freedom, which is the Christian ideal. So clearly, Franklin Roosevelt was in favor of preserving our nation of America against the imperial Japanese and against the fascism, the um, National Socialist Workers' Party that's going on in Germany. And uh, it's interesting, you know, they, they use terms, but the fascism is where you have big government and big business working together. And so today, what party is fascist? Well, let's see, you have big government of Zuckerberg and $400 million being funneled to support the Democrat Party. You have uh, Bezos, you have uh, Warren Buffett, you have um, George Soros using their big money to support the, the Democrat Party. And so if there's any party that's fascist, it would be the Democrats. Well, what right. you're saying, and that's why it's so important that, you know, we really kind of peel the layers back on this Christian nationalist thing, because uh, it's the old thing of he who controls uh, the language controls the culture. It's a war of words. Yeah. And now on a, so here I am a pastor, right? And I, you know, my journey of the Lord taking me to, to awaken me to our, our nation's true history really started at a whole new level in 2008 and then 2012. But one of the things on an individual level, when I counseled a lot, I began to notice some things that, you know, I would have two people in for counseling, husband, wife, whatever, and the accusations would start flying. And then after a while, I started going, well, now that's funny because the accusations that are coming from this person are what they're doing. And, and what you're saying about the Democratic Party with so many things in our nation's history to the present, and now we've got these globalists and all this kind of thing, the very accusation, in fact, it's gotten to the point where I look at it and I see what they're accusing us of, and then I know what they're guilty of. And so the Christian nationalist thing really, you said, used to be like Christian patriot. And now uh, I'm seeing where you're going with this. They take a, a negative word and, and, and insert it. And if a person's not schooled on this, then they'll kind of back away going, look at those, those conservative Christian people. They're out to destroy our country. When really what I see is the other side, that is their goal, and they project over unto us. Am I right in that? Yeah, so it's called psychological projection. Mm. Sigmund Freud coined the term. It's the uh, immediate narcissistic response when somebody is caught in doing something wrong, they will accuse the person that caught them of what they're guilty of. So in the Bible, you have Potiphar's wife lusting after Joseph, but when she's caught, she accuses Joseph of lusting after her. You have um, Nero sets fire to Rome, but he blames the Christians. Paul's praying in Jerusalem. The Pharisees see him, grab him. They're pulling him apart. The Romans rescue him. They have to have a trial. And the Tertullus, the Pharisee attorney, accuses Paul and says, we found this man a pestilent fellow, a, a mover of sedition, stirring up the masses. And Paul said, they neither can they. I was just in the temple praying. It was just 14 days ago I went down to Jerusalem. I was, they didn't find me stirring up the mass. I wasn't arguing with anybody. They can't prove the things they just said. They were accusing Paul of the insurrection at the Capitol when they were the ones guilty at the, of the insurrection at the Capitol. You have um, uh, this blame shifting. They did it to Jesus himself. They accused Jesus of having a demon. Well, he's casting out these devils because he, he's the prince of demons, right? And, and yet they were the ones that Jesus said, you're your father, the devil. Oh, Abraham's our father. Because no, if Abraham was you'd believe in me. And, they, and Adam did it to God. He blame shifted. Wow. He says, the woman you gave me, Adam sinned, but he blamed God. Well, the woman you gave me, it's, her, it's your fault, really. And so when somebody is caught in a, little kids, it's, it's natural. I didn't start the fight, you did. Right? A cheating spouse will accuse the faithful spouse of being unfaithful. And so it's gotten into politics. <laughs> I was listening to NPR radio, April 2010, David Axelrod was on, and he began to explain, he goes, in Chicago politics, we have a tradition where you throw a brick through your own campaign office window, and then you call a press conference to accuse your opponent. And the press, the opponent's like, what? I, I didn't do it. And he's on the defensive. 
And then the media keeps repeating it and repeating it until pretty soon people make a mental association of this candidate with a crime. And then they say that if you're accused, never repeat the crime in denying the accusation because all they're wanting is word association. They want to be able to print the article that has your name and three letters, three words away is the name of the crime. And, they, and people just say, you name crime, name crime, name crime. And so it's gotten into politics where you can have maybe a, a candidate running for president and as secretary of state, uh, she's giving away a fifth of the U.S. uranium to Russia. And at the same time, lo and behold, appears $145 million contributions to her Clinton Foundation with people that are associated with this Uranium One exchange. And so she looks like she's colluding with Russia. What does she do? She pays for a steel dossier to accuse her opponent of colluding with Russia. And when the, it finally gets back to she's the one involved, she gets slapped with a $113,000 fine from the FEC for paying for the steel dossier to accuse her opponent of colluding with Russia. But by that time, the public's already made up their mind. The water's muddied and the public doesn't know who to trust. And she gets a pass for having colluded with Russia. You have another candidate that's extorting Ukraine on C-SPAN saying, I told them stop investigating my son or I'm gonna hold back billions of dollars in US aid. What do they do? They accuse his opponent of extorting Ukraine. They accuse them of exactly the same thing they're guilty of. And then let's say there's a candidate that they know has uh, documents that are classified in his garage next to his Corvette. And they know if this becomes public, the, the, the public is gonna make a big deal of it. So they wanna stage an intentionally front page article of raiding documents from an innocent past president just for the headline's sake. So that people say classified documents, classified documents. And then when it finally comes out that uh, the other guy had classified documents in his garage next to his Corvette, oh, by that time it's old news. And, and so this idea is they accuse the opponent of what they're guilty of and they do it every day. And so the people that accuse Christians of wanting to set up a nationalism, it's like, no, you're wanting to set up a woke nationalism. I mean, let's look at it. You're wanting to take away freedom of speech. You're wanting to, to, to put people, call pro-life Catholics you know, enemies, literally put people in jail for a decade simply because they wanted to save babies at an abortion clinic. I mean, uh, they're, they're uh, doing facial recognition software trying to track people. And then you have a, a president had the biggest threat to America is these, you know, white Christian nationalists. It's like, no, you're, you're the one that's the threat, but you're projecting it. So you're consolidating power. You've co-opted the, the IRS. Um, you know, Obama had the IRS do audits, met with Lois Lerner, the head of the IRS 147 times. And during that time, they were having the IRS target conservative organizations. And when she's called to testify, she just uh, pleads the fifth, stands up and walks out. Um, and then they co-opt the media. They, they, they co-opt the intelligence gathering communities. So they're the ones that are consolidating power and they're wanting to accuse people that want to keep the control in the hands of the people as the bad people. Um, William Henry Harrison was the ninth president and in his inaugural address, he warned of presidents consolidating power. And he, he basically said, beware of those that have unusual professions of wanting to preserve democracy because they're the ones guilty of wanting to destroy it. So when you have a, uh, so we gotta preserve democracy, we gotta preserve democracy. So, so wait a second, a flag should go up. They're actually behind the scenes destroying democracy, but they're wanting to accuse their opponent of doing what they're guilty of. And, um, but again, little kids do it. I didn't start the fight, you did. Cheating spouses do it. I didn't cheat. You know, they accuse the innocent spou spouse. So, um, uh, so nationalism, it's the opposite of globalism. Um, and so globalists that want a one world government do not like people that are wanting to preserve their nations. And number two, nas Christian nationalism used to be called Christian patriotism. And everybody, Democrat and Republican, encouraged Christian patriotism. I mean, you had Harry S. Truman, and he uh, pushed through the annual National Day of Prayer. And, uh, and then you had John F. Kennedy in his inaugural address. The rights of man come not from the generosity of the state, but from the hand of God. Well, that's a Bible concept. It's not an Islamist concept because people don't have, you know, infidels don't get rights from Allah, you know. And, and it's not a Hindu concept where they have a caste system. And if you're an untouchable in the lowest caste, you don't have rights compared to a, 
you know, a, a, a Brahmin in the highest castle. So here you have presidents that are uh, Christian and they're wanting to preserve our nation. But then there's a, a third thing. Nationalism depends on what nation you're in. In Germany, which was the National Socialist Workers' Party, nationalism is bad because socialism doesn't have rights for individuals. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, USSR, nationalism is bad because the Soviet Union doesn't have rights for the people. Um, but in America, we're a nation that's, that is guaranteeing the freedom of religion. We're guaranteeing the freedom of press. We're guaranteeing the freedom of speech. We're guaranteeing the freedom to right to possess and barbs. So their fear is, well, you're going to force your Christian nationalism on us. It's like, okay, we're going to force freedom of religion on you. We're going to force freedom of conscience on you. We're going to force freedom of press on you. It's like, how do you force freedoms on people? Right? And so they're, oh, we're afraid of these Christian nationalists because they're going to force their beliefs. We're going to force freedom of religion. We're, we're going to force freedom of conscience on you. It's like, you know, <laughs> it, it makes no sense. We're a country founded and dedicated to these Christian principles that your worship of God is only pleasing to God if it's freely given. We fled from kings that wanted to burn people at the stake for not believing the government mandates. We're a nation dedicated to freedom of conscience and freedom of religion. Bill, that is the most articulate explanation of what is going on right now in this country with people trying to tag us as Christian nationalists. Um, and, and really, uh, your book, Backfired, is going to reveal this is nothing new under the sun. And uh, ultimately, we had to start working together, quit fighting one another as Christians. And that's happening right now. And I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to pray over us. Father, we thank you for our dear friend, Bill Federer, for his work, his labor, his ministry, to really bring to us the truth of your word, the truth concerning the history of our nation. And I ask your blessing upon him, his work, and I pray, Lord, that you will use your people to get the truth out in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want to encourage you, if you need further ministry, call us. Our team is waiting to pray with you. The number's on your screen. Also, be sure to join our email list to stay updated on what is happening. It'll include new series and guests. Go to markcowart.org. And please visit Bill Federer's website, AmericanMinute.com, correct? And get these books. I tell you, if, if Bill Federer has authored it, get the book. <laughs> You're going to enjoy it. And we'll see you on the next broadcast. Thank you for watching this video and be sure to explore more of my YouTube channel for more content like this. And if you want to learn more about what we do or if you want to partner with us, be sure to visit my website at markcoward.org. May the Lord bless you richly.